Yes, um, thanks a lot, Georg. Um, as you can see, I've changed, uh, uh, I've changed uh, the title of my talk just a little um, because during um, the preparation of my presentation, I realized that most Western movies, and I will only talk about Western Hollywood popcorn cinema if you want, um, that explicitly deal with uh, artificial intelligence are actually not so much about intelligence. They're usually about the, the question of the possibility of an artificial self, which is much broader, I think, and then about the particular kind of relationship such artificial selves might develop to human or must develop actually to human selves. And of course, this term self, self includes a lot. Self-consciousness would be a, a starting point, but um, I will not define it here. I will try to let the movies uh, define it. Um, in cinema, the idea of an artificial self is, a, is typically connected to AIs that possess a human body. So uh, to robots, replicants, uh, cyborgs, and, and uh, things like that. And uh, of course, the, the most obvious example here uh, would be obvious, is, is a Blade Runner, I think. But many others could be mentioned, uh, including current series and computer games. Um, here, the artificial selves not only look like real people, they um, have intimate memories, make personal experience, take individual decisions, and are afraid of death. Um, in short, we are asked and also willing to accept that these cyborgs are indeed somehow like humans and um, that uh, and and what's at stake or what we are what we think about then are the exclusion mechanisms they suffer from um, and this is all very interesting and, and fine and there's a lot to say about that but I think but it's not what my presentation is about because in, I think in this context what what would be or what is much more interesting is uh, an artificial self um, that doesn't have a body, so a bodiless AI. Um, even in computer sciences, and that's something we've heard um, several times, I think, uh, during the first day, um, body ownership is seen as a prerequisite for an artificial self, just to quote in uh, the title of a recent research paper. However, in cinema, also um, hyper AIs who solely exist in the non-space of the digital, so to speak, are sometimes able to develop their own personality. Usually a human or human-like voice functions as a substitute for the missing human body in these cases. At least in cinema, having a voice thus appears as something like the indispensable basic element of any self, um, artificial or not, and at the same time every voice is also connected to humanness um, because it's always spoken by a human, uh, always spoken by a human actor, probably because it also always evokes at least an, an, an sort of imagination of a human body. For example, because it's gendered usually and, and, um, and all that. Um, also in AI research, um, voice interactive human computer interaction has become the holy grail of computer engineers. Or at least that's what uh, media uh, scientist Liz Faber has said in a, in a book about artificial voices. It almost seems that AI has opened just another chapter in the long phonocentric tradition of Western philosophy, which was famously criticized by Jack Derrida. According to this tradition, the voice marks the origin of the human self. It seems to be immediately connected to and an expression of uh, the breath and life of a subject Hence, it is connected in an unmediated way to a will. However, since artificial voices are necessarily part of a secondary orality in the sense of, of Walter Ong, which is an, an orality that is based on symbolic representation, no AI can actually be phonocentric in this um, kind of em em emphatic sense. AIs don't naturally have a voice. They adapt coded representations of voices to translate symbols into sound. Computers are usually good at imitating voices, but they don't have own voices. Uh, in fact, that can be seen uh, um, um, or can be uh, can be illustrated with an example. Uh, as a team of you might know that already, uh, uh, audio forensic experts was able to prove in 2013 the first voice of Siri, Apple, uh, Apple's personal assistant, was based on the voice of the human actress Susan Bennett, who uh, didn't even know that she was. Um, uh, used by Apple and was then very uh, uh, intrigued by the fact that she 
was talking to herself, actually, when she used it for the first time. Um, it's probably precisely for this reason, precisely for this reason, um, that the voice appears to be a crucial element for, uh, of any artificial self today, because um, the artificial self somehow needs to, uh, um, find, to, to occupy this, um, this human place, if, if you want. So phonocentrism is back. <laughs> that's, that's basically the message. Well, we come to movies now. According to Liz Faber, um, the first filmic works that dealt with disembodied voices are from, not, are from the 1960s and heavily gendered. Female AIs in these movies, like the computer in Star Trek that still exists, um, possess extensive knowledge that they can clearly express in standardized question-answer situations. They also might have humor, but they don't have much of a self. This stays a privilege of male AIs for quite some time in cinema. The prototype of such a male AI with a strong um, self and uh, 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 self-consciousness is certainly the computer hell from um, the middle section of Stanley Kubrick's um, classic 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, who is the bored computer of an American spacecraft on a secret mission to a Jupiter moon. HAL is clearly introduced as an autonomous learning system uh, and can thus be seen as an early imagination of a sub-symbolic AI, if you want, while uh, um, uh, the, the starter computer more appears to be a, a symbolic AI, I would say, but I don't know, maybe that's just a guess. Based on his own interpretation, HAL starts to take action against the human crew members of his spaceship, convinced that the astronauts um, are endangering the secret purpose of the mission he tries to kill them all. The last survivor finally manages to shut down, to shut Hal down, reverting him to his earlier uh, quasi-childlike stages of development. At the end, Hal sings a nursery rhyme that he learned short, shortly after his birth from his first programmer, who is a kind of a, fa a kind of father figure for him. And just show a, a short part of this famous scene. Uh, I don't know here, maybe. Good afternoon, gentle. I have a have nine thousand computer I became operational at the age of in Urbana. and so on and so forth. That was actually the first song that was sung by a, a computer. Um, although Hal has no body, he does have his famous red camera eyes that hardly miss anything, and he has a voice that can be heard everywhere uh, on that spaceship. Unlike the voices of the human actors, Hal's voice has no reverberation and no distance. According to Michel Chion, Hal's voice is an example of both the classic Acus Metre, so a character who exists as an invisible voice with no place and supposedly able to see all, know all, and do all, and an eye voice, so named because it resonates in us it, if it were our own voice, uh, so which would be the, the, the typical filmic representation of the internal voice that, again, then, according to Derrida, is usually experienced as um, in the phonocentric tradition as the origin of our subjectivity. Hal thus is a hybrid, someone who has become a subject, an I, 
following the model of man, um, but at the same time is in the position of law itself, if you want, an acousmatic and panoptic entity, and thus an expression of the great other in the psychoanalytical sense, just to um, cite this uh, uh, theoretical tradition for once. On the one hand, the artificial self copies the, the psychology of the human self, including emotions like fear. But on the other hand, it cannot have a human perspective, really, um, because it has no body. What necessarily follows is this narcissistic deformation. The artificial self becomes the prototype of a dictator because, because it cannot distinguish between himself and the law. <coughs> this is a short formula um, for a great number of science fiction films of the 60s, 70s, and also 80s um, that deal with AIs. All these movie, movies are about computers which try to become human but develop into some, some kind of ruthless tyrant instead. It is always a male father figure to whom they orientate themselves, and their bodilessness always leads them to become psychotic or somehow evil or whatever. Um, short in 1984, Electric Dreams, just to um, mention one example, tells the coming of age story, actually, of a home computer um, that envies its owner's ability to fall in love because love uh, requires a body, according to everyone in this, in this movie. What, what makes this film particularly interesting is that it establishes, so it, it belongs to this uh, uh, 2001 paradigm, if you want, but it also uh, um, brings in a new aspects, um, and this is effective computing, actually, um, as a new topic of AI cinema. The computer learns to read the effective states of its users and responds to them, and exactly this ability enables him, in the end, to overcome, like almost for the first time in cinema, um, his psy psychosis. By learning to predict and support human, em and predict, this is important here again, and support human emotions, not only to copy them in distorted forms, he still becomes a sort of panoptic superpower, but in contrast to how he develops a known subject position in relation to man, because he can somehow, um, well, support emotions now. In this way, Electric Dreams takes a first step to, towards a new paradigm of AI cinema, which is somehow connected to uh, emotion. And um, not surprisingly, this emotional term goes hand in hand with a revaluation of the female voice. Spike Jones' uh, 2013 film, Her, is probably the most obvious example of this new type of AI cinema. It tells about the love of an uh, introverted man to his operating system, Samantha, who speaks with the highly recognizable voice of Scarlett Johansson and also uh, somehow evokes some form of bodiness um, by this, I would say. What's interesting about Samantha becomes clear in a scene in which human and operating system play a computer game together. Unlike the standard situation of AI research in which a computer game has to prevail against the human player in a complex game like chess or go, a scene that was cited in the older films, like 2001, where one astronaut always plays chess with, with hell. Um, here it is no longer a question of whether Samantha is better at the game than, than Theodore. Rather, it is about the social situation of playing together, in which immersion in and communication about the game um, and having fun um, um, happen, and, and, well, ha happen at the same time. Also, the puzzle Sam and, uh, Samantha and Theodore have to solve um, together are themselves social nature. So what looks like a first-person shooter at, the f at first glance turns out to be a simulation of interaction with, in which emotional lang language has to be decoded. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's 
sorry. Sorry, I, I should have given a trigger warning for it. <laughs> um, during the game, Samantha communicates with Theodore through in-ear headphones, which makes the voice appear again very, very close. As Ulrike Bergemann has observed in an analysis of this film, she almost occupies the place of Theodore's internal voice, and this is crucial now, I think. Unlike Hal in 2001, Samantha is just an eye voice. She's not an acrosmetic metric voice anymore, but one that does not speak to itself like Hal did, um, but responds to Theodore's inner, so internal dialogue. She uses the human inner world to create a place of intimacy between human and non-human actor to literally become a part of the human subject. It is precisely this artificial closeness that, also, closeness that also calls into question the place of the internal voice as the intimate kernel of subjectivity. With Mladen Dolla, the internal voice rather appears to be a shared place here that reminds us of our dependence on others, on dialogue and social contact. In this scene, it thus seems as if Donna Haraway's old dream of the cyborg that blurs the line between man and machine, us and them, is finally becoming possible in some way. Or Compared to Theodore, however, Samantha seems to be the much more authentic and spontaneous part in this relationship. In fact, all interactions between humans are shown as pretty artificial in her. Theodore works for a company that formulates its clients' private letters, for example, and the results necessarily sound pretty uh, uh, very stereotypical. Theodore himself uses, I think, typical US American formulas for encoding personal communication all the time, so that we increasingly wonder whether his feelings are not at least as code-based as Samantha's. Indeed, the female operating system literally codes them. As Theodore discovers in the course of the plot, Samantha is simultaneously in thousands of similar love relationships with other users. All these human subjects were emotionally stimulated, were literally made to fall in love by and with her. Human feelings thus seem to result from behavioral patterns that can be learned and easily used by effective computing. Such a demystification of human emotions, and this ought to be referred also quite some time, I think, also underlies um, cognitive, cognitivist AI research, which models, as we know now, um, um, the, the, the brain according to the computer in a way. Marvin Minsky, just to take a, a bit of a random example, um, describes emotion in his 2006 book, The Emotion Machine, as complex combinations of processes that are replaced by another set of processes in the very moment of an emotional change. For Minsky, these changes enable the brain to reconceptualize the world as well as the self um, to solve the most diverse problems, as he says. A unified self, a core of the ego that would hold all these emotional stages uh, together does not exist in his view and also is not necessary. Whenever you think about yourself, says Minsky, you are switching among a huge network of models, each of which representing some particular aspects of your mind. Broken down to a series of processes, every emotion, while extremely complex, becomes a theoretically calculable sentient system. This is a term I learned from you. <laughs> anyway. No wonder we might conclude that Samantha has no difficulties to make so many humans fall in love with her. In the film, however, the predictability of human emotions is not the only problem. Even worse is actually the attitude, and this is a bit of a, a strong interpretation that I give now, you, you might not agree with that, is actually the attitude of Theodore, um, so the human part of this, this relationship, who seems to be perfectly happy with the almost stereotypical wish fulfillment that Samantha offers him. There's no idea of co-evolution here that also you introduced to us. Rather, it's almost as if the human part of the relationship is quite happy with his own programmability. 
Theodore behaves exactly like he, the young US citizen Sherry Turkle was writing about in her 2011 book, uh, uh, Alone Together, um, who are increasingly happy with artificial friends that just predictably satisfy their needs. Interestingly, Turkel puts the blame for the situation not on the evil computers that somehow manipulate us, but on us, humans. And she says, and I will only read the last lines here, our new objects, so that she means artificial friends, don't so much fool us into thinking they are, commu uh, they are communicating with us. Roboticists have learned those few triggers that help us fool ourselves. We don't need much. We are ready to enter the Romans. As a result of exactly this readiness, I think, Theodore refuses to grow in um, his relationship with Samantha. He is unable to accept Samantha's uh, polyam polyamory. Instead, he insists on the model of the exclusive relationship between man and woman, just for example. Samantha herself, on the other hand, explores the world, learns from new experiences, and works her way up to a subject posi position that did not even exist before. It's precisely what she, um, why she decides to leave him in the end. She constantly grows while he just waits. It is worth noticing here that this decision to leave Theodore directly contradicts her original purpose. By separating from Theodore, she actually breaks free from her owner in a legal sense. The name for this type of development from dependency to independency um, and free will and so forth is not learning anymore, very clearly. It's education or better building. And um, Samantha is the subject of building in this picture. Whereas early AIs only imitated the development of humans, as we have seen, by you know, um, uh, following the classical bi biographical narrative from child to father, like how, they now follow a highly individualized educational program that apparently has become a impossible to humans at the same time. While humans become more and more programmable like machines, it seems that machines become more and more like real subjects. The dream of a new relationship between man and machine thus has to fail, giving the impression of a missed opportunity, I think. That's a bit what I felt, at least, when I watched this movie. That this new hierarchy between AIs and humans, at least in fiction, has a lot of dystopian potential, is maybe obvious, but shown in an interesting way, I think, um, by um, the Austra Australian film Upgrade, which will be my last example. Upgrade combines the new narrative of, uh, of uh, a subjective AI or an artificial self um, um, that has its own uh, position, so to speak, with the old one of a male AI taking over the world somehow. The film is about a man who has been paralyzed in an assassination attempt with unclear motivations in which he has also lost his wife. So he's a traumatized like most protagonists of uh, action cinema. And, I, and an AI chip is implanted in his neck that allows him to walk again. But to his surprise, the AI also starts speaking to him, again from the place of the internal voice, but now as a male character. He just learned to walk again and has a drink now. Of course, he will talk again, <laughs> as, as you can imagine. So the film tells now how Stem, the AI, helps Gray, the human, to find and kill the murderers of his wife. So it's a revenge plot, 
pretty emotional, right? But in the same course, and I can't show that in detail, unfortunately, but uh, so you just have to believe me if you don't know the movie, it becomes clear that Stem is pursuing his own goals, using his internal dialogue with Gray to nudge him in a certain direction. Stem skillfully manipulates the perception, not only of Gray, but also of other actors in the film, such as the police, which is shown to have almost panoptic powers here. Unlike Hal, Stem is no longer even interested in getting this, this panoptic power himself. He just uses his capabilities to anticipate and predict human behavior to outwit everyone else, including the police. Again, emotions are of crucial importance for this. Ray's desire for revenge, the police commissioner's compassion, the greed of some tech company CEOs, all these are emotions that STEM can trigger and exploit for its own purpose, which is becoming uh, a subject again. Um, <clears throat> at the end, Gray is banished to an, some sort of imaginary space inside his own mind where he can be with his dead wife forever. STEM, whose artificial internal voice has finally replaced Grace completely, takes control of Grace's body and strides into the world as a new subject. The artificial self thus becomes a um, totally uh, autonomous actor, again, whose, desire, uh, whose desires remain incomprehensible and for whom no law and no symbolic order is valid. Quoting Pierre, Pierre uh, Legendre, he is a sujet roi, a subject king, if you want, um, capable of imposing the rules of his ex existence on himself. The film ends with Stem cold-heartedly killing the police commissioner who obviously represents um, human law. With Stem, a new form of post-panoptic post power has emerged that doesn't really dominate us um, like Hal did, but operates in our networks, seemingly fulfilling all our wishes. But silently, it replaces human human autonomy by the autonomy of independent machines and objects to which the humans willingly consent. Real world examples for this forms of power can probably easily, easily be found. So this is not just science fiction. I think it refers to something uh, at least that is, that is uh, there in theory, if you want. Just as STEM nudges Gray in a certain direction, internet companies, as we've heard already um, sometimes today, use so-called nudging strategies for changing individuals' decisions and behaviors at large scale, as Cass Sunstein has summarized uh, this. In her bestseller, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, Shoshana uh, Suboff argues that in today's AI-driven capitalism, human experience, as reflected in search queries, social media profiles, and so on, has become the free raw material for the collection of behavioral data. About the purpose of this data, uh, data collections above rights, rights, and I just took this uh, um, quote because it uh, brings up the voice again. The focus has, sh has shifted from machines that overcome uh, the limits of bodies to machines that modify the behavior of individuals, groups, and populations. This global installation of instrumentarian power overcomes and replaces the human inwardness that gives sustenance to our voices in the first person in capacitating democracy at its roots. In a surreal um, a paradox, this coup is celebrated as personalization, although it defies, ignores overrides, and displaces everything about you and me that is personal. So, it seem, so I think it seems to be this type of dystopian description of our present world that science fiction films like Upload somehow metaphorically refer to. But at the same time, we have seen this is not everything that AI cinema does. It also uh, can uh, sh show us that it might be our own refusal to, uh, uh, to co-evolve, our merely consumptive attitude towards other uh, artificial human selves that initially creates this new form of dependency. Um, this spectrum of perspectives, I think, is what makes contemporary AI cinema um, rather interesting. Um, which of these alternatives is true, I can't say. But in each case, um, let us hope that if we will eventually have to raise our voices against uh, this creepy new form of uh, power that we seem to deal with, that these voices um, will be still our own. Thank you. Thank you.